From the Free Press, this is Honestly. I'm Michael Moynihan. If you're a listener to this podcast and hopefully you're a reader of the Free Press as well, chances are that you're someone who doesn't always love legacy media outlets. Maybe you've seen the mainstream media spin the truth or maybe omit information, possibly in service of a political agenda. Maybe you've watched journalists you respect act as partisan cheerleaders rather than down the middle purveyors of information. In the last few years, there's been a Cambrian explosion of independent media, podcasts, Substack newsletters, Twitter feeds, YouTube shows, all promising an alternative to the mainstream. A few days ago, I sat down with someone who cut her teeth in the mainstream media, becoming one of the most influential voices in the political debate. From her meteoric rise at Fox News to her misbegotten stint at NBC, Megyn Kelly has been a central figure in American journalism for over a decade. You might recall her contentious exchange with then-candidate Donald Trump during the 2015 Republican presidential debate, after which Trump famously accused Kelly of having her period. But Kelly has since abjured the mainstream. She now hosts an eponymous podcast on Sirius XM, which has fast become one of the most popular political shows in the country. And her success captures the broader media shift away from brands like Fox and NBC to more personal one-on-one relationships between commentator and consumer. But this new world is not without its own problems. People are hungry for unbiased, unfiltered information. Is independent media always trustworthy? Does it need some of the guardrails and editorial processes that were once common at legacy outlets? Because if one peers out into this independent and often just right-wing media landscape, one cannot help but notice the frequent descents into conjecture and conspiracy theory from commentators like Tucker Carlson, Tim Poole, Brett Weinstein. Look, almost everyone in the media can be seduced by confirmation bias and audience capture. I do not pretend to be an exception. Look, and maybe it's just how we consume news in 2024, but there just seems to be so much more of it these days. On today's show, Megan and I discuss all of this, the role of conspiracy theory in our current discourse, where she stands politically these days, how the legacy press is handling the presidential election, how she says she avoided Trump derangement syndrome, even as some of Trump's most diehard supporters showered her with threats and her guiding principles as a journalist. We'll be right back. Megan Kelly, welcome to Honestly. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, the other day I got uh, this email newsletter from Semaphore, and the headline on the piece was Inside Megan Kelly's YouTube Success. And the first line was that TV network insiders thought her broadcast career was likely over after NBC. And then the rest of the article went on to point out that is not the case that you have made quite a success of yourself on YouTube. Tell me why you think that is. I mean, there's so many people that do podcasts, but you have essentially a TV show that is not tethered to a network and it's doing amazingly well. I know everybody would say about their podcast, well, I'm honest, and I, but I really mean it and I really do think it's the reason that we've, we've done well in this space. I'm genuinely honest. When I don't know something, I'll tell them when we're speculating about facts and we don't actually have it nailed down, I'll tell the audience. And I think over the years, they've gotten to know I'm not going to mislead them just to earn their love. I want their respect more than I want their love. And um, I'm also very quick to understand that my opinion is not the only in the world. You know, that I might be wrong on something. My audience may disagree with me on something. But I think the bargain is that I'll tell them how I actually feel after we establish a real set of facts. And then how they feel about it is up to them. I don't judge them. And they can tolerate me. So that's kind of how I think it works. And I, I think in today's day and age, that's refreshing because there's just, there are so many guardrails around so many conversations. This is one of the reasons why Barry and I first fell in love, right? That she's mm-hmm. also trying to create a space where you can have real conversations. And um, I think I'm just probably slightly more R-rated and blunt than Barry is in my particular approach. I mean, if you look back to the Megyn Kelly that was at Fox News and then the Megyn Kelly who went to NBC and this iteration of Megyn Kelly, I mean, are you effectively the same person? Have you changed 
in any significant way and as if your kind of worldview changed? Yeah, I feel like I've changed a lot, actually. I would say the the me that was on Fox News was doing a different thing than I'm doing now. You know, I was trying to be a straight news journalist who put on people who would give their opinions and I would guide the discussion. And occasionally I would get fired up over some nonsense that happened on the show. But I wasn't really in the business of giving my opinion, which was unusual for a primetime position. But it worked. So I was always trying to toe the line to, like, guide the discussion without being too opinionated you know tom lowell my uh ep and and i used to joke like how far are we going to lift the dress up you know like not that far not not that far in that role and now the dress is all the way up i mean now i've really i've given my opinion on almost everything there's only a couple areas where i wouldn't and um i love it i didn't come into podcasting thinking i would do it but then i realized there's just no other way of doing this business than really being honest about how you feel what are the things that you wouldn't actually talk about? You said almost everything that you would give your opinion on. You said there are some guardrails. What are those? I don't talk about abortion. I just uh-huh. don't talk about my own personal feelings on abortion. I don't know. To me, that one just seems like such a crazy one to cross and um, offer your own opinions on as for somebody who does consider herself a journalist still. I just felt so deeply personal and is so personal to every woman I know that I just don't feel right about it. Are you a conservative at this point? I mean, I, we've talked about this in the past on the show. You've said to me that, you know, you guys, and this is the show that I do and the two guys that I do with, you know, are somewhere in the middle of a lot of issues. We don't tow any particular lines. We just kind of look at the evidence and come up to a conclusion, not particularly tribal. You said something very similar to me once. I mean, I I feel that you're more conservative now than maybe you have been in the past sort of four or five years. Is that wrong? I really do feel that the ground shifted under my feet. You know, I I don't know. I, I don't feel like I've changed my positions on really anything other than the trans nonsense. And I explained all of that in a long show we did a couple of years ago about how I'd evolved on that and really am very regretful of the way that I covered that early on in my career. I mean, I forgive... A piece of it because my heart was in the right place, but I feel like I was taken advantage of by people who were bad actors. In any event, um, I just think the the world has changed. It's gotten so crazy. You could be open minded to immigration, for example. Like, okay, a lot of corporations seem to need it. Maybe it's jobs that Americans aren't taking. Um, it's the foundation of how our country got started. And then, whammo, you've got between 10 and 20 illegals in the country running around murdering American citizens. And it's a hard no now. So that, I don't know if that makes me more conservative or just appropriately reacting to the situation on the ground as it changes. Um, If, you know, I would tell you that I'm not ideological, that I see myself as center right. Um, I can't think of much that I'm liberal on, but I'm not like hard right on most things. And I'm easily able to converse with actual liberals and center lefties and the far lefties aren't for me. Um, However, I took one of those tests online, you know, what are you? And it said, I'm very conservative. So I don't know what the truth is, Michael. (laughs) I've taken them and it says you're a complete psychopath and just my computer shuts down. But uh, yeah, it's like, I don't answer them. Honestly, I'm lying to my computer. You know, you have this <laughs> this interesting thing that, um, you know, I've talked to people about and people who have seen me on your show and, you know, want to know, like, you know, so, you know, Megan's politics. One of the things that I think interests people, me included, is that you've had some really rough exchanges with people in the past. Donald Trump. You've called women you don't like fat pigs, dogs, slobs and disgusting animals. Your Twitter account. Only Rosie several- O'Donnell. <laughs> What I say is what I say. And honestly, Megan, if you don't like it, I'm sorry. I've been very nice to you, although I could probably maybe not be based on the way you have treated me, but I wouldn't do that. Um, Famously, Newt Gingrich, where you told him to come back to your show when he's gotten some manners. We're going to have to leave it at that. And you can take your anger issues and spend some time working on them, Mr. Speaker. He has come back to your show. Donald Trump has been on your show. Anger anger, management. Oh, anger management. Is that what you said? Anger management. <laughs> um, Donald Trump, of course, has. You have a very famous relationship with him. There is a Hollywood movie 
about you and Roger Ailes, yet I hear you say all these very generous things about Roger Ailes' talents as a broadcaster. I mean, how do you kind of navigate that when you have people that you've had some kind of personal issues with and they've become blown up into big things? And then as a journalist, you have them come back, they somehow agree to come back, and then you have sort of productive conversations with them. Well, I try my best to remove myself from the situation, my own ego, if it's somebody who's a new subject, you know, like, like Trump, uh, like Steve Bannon, eventually. Um, I, it's much more helpful to my audience and to me, in, in terms of my own mental health, frankly, if I can just remove my own ego from it and say, you know, when Trump was coming after me, was he really coming after Megyn Kelly, the woman, or was he coming after Megyn Kelly, journalist, and sort of a, the branded Megyn Kelly? I definitely believe it was the latter, and I believe that's totally fair game, you know, that, look, it's not to endorse everything that Trump did and all that, but I'm just saying, Megyn Kelly, the journalist, is fair game. And that made it easier for me to cover him fairly. And the same thing with Steve Bannon. He was trying to get a president elected. He, he wasn't trying to ruin my life. He was trying to get a president elected, and he did it. And now I think the GOP is in a place where we need Steve Bannons because they're locking up you know, former presidents are trying to. So it, desperate times and so on. Anyway, that's generally my exercise. And plus, as a rule, I'm very, very forgiving. I'm tough to offend in the first place. And I'm very, very forgiving. Life is too short. And you really have absolutely no friends if you're a journalist, if you hold grudges against people who say or do mean things where you're concerned. Conservatism has changed quite a bit from when, you know, I started in this game and started in this business. And you could say there was a lot more neoconservatism. There was a lot more stuff about free markets. I mean, you wouldn't attack trade all the time. Foreign wars were A-OK -okay with everybody. And you see a very, very big shift to populism, you know, and it's rubbed off from Trump all the way down through almost everybody in the GOP. There's a couple of outliers. Where do you see the conservative movement these days? I mean, have you moved with it as it's moved into this more populist direction? Were you always that way? In kind of how do you view this kind of Trumpian party? And, you know, does it remain this party if Donald Trump disappears? Look, he said, if I lose this election, I'm not coming back. But does Trumpism stay? Is this the party that we have forever now? Yeah, so I, Trump's won. It's his Republican Party now. And MAGA has won. And it will long outlive Donald Trump. And I think it will long dominate past Donald Trump. I think the, you know, old conservatives, my pals over at National Review, are an important part of the party. They are, they are a necessary part of the party and represent a huge faction of old school conservatives. But they're the minority now in the GOP. And I think MAGA has risen, is ascendant still, and uh, will dominate for decades to come. That's, that's how I feel. Um, for myself, I navigate it easily because, as I said, I'm not ideological. So what I like to do is try not to dig my heels in too hard on any of these issues. And since I'm not inclined to be a political person, that's easy for me. What I want to do as a lawyer is understand. What, what's, where are the factions? What are these guys saying? And so it's the reason why, even when they were actively warring with each other in the same 10-day span, I could have on Tucker Carlson and Ben Shapiro. You know, I could have on Steven Crowder and Jeremy Boring of The Daily Wire. Right? I, like, you mm -hmm. name it. I can, I can take different guys or gals from different factions and put them on together and give them a fair hearing. And I like that and I want to maintain that. So I try not to really dig too deep personally into any one of these positions that's driving uh, these factions apart. You mentioned Tucker. Um, you know Tucker well. You just did a on stage uh, thing with him in the last week, right? And um, you know, I've known him for years. I knew him when, when he was self-identifying as a libertarian. You know, there's been a lot of controversy about Tucker, you know, for, for ages now, but it seems to have become something that the right is engaged in, right? I mean, we, we had an episode with Victor Davis Hanson saying Tucker's gone a little too far on this stuff about Churchill and about World War II and about some of this revisionism, you know, his embrace of Alex Jones. And, you know, he said the other day that Alex Jones has been right about almost everything. Do you think that there are boundaries that one shouldn't trespass in the way that kind of William F. Buckley used to police the kind of outer uh, fringes of conservatism and say, too far for us. Do you think that that's happening, particularly with somebody like Tucker? 
No, not with him. Um, I'm not going to say there are no boundaries because I've certainly revolted in watching certain personalities go really out there. He's not one of them. Um, so for me personally, it would, there are some people who push it too far. But I wouldn't say Tucker is in that category. And I didn't hear VDH on, honestly, my, my apologies, but I did hear him on his own podcast. And I agreed with every word he said. I, I think if you're, op, if you're on the wrong side of VDH when it comes to history, especially World War II, you're on the wrong side, period. Like, that's, mm -hmm. he's a true expert. He knows everything. And I trust and believe him. But, you know, my own take on it is, a, I don't have a ton of time to study World War II history and, and exactly what Churchill, you know, how neo Connie he was. I, like, okay, there's other people who are going to look into that. But I think Tucker is and remains a very, very positive force for good. Even though he does some podcasts that I don't align with or agree with or, you know, I don't know, approve of, is that it, that's not really the right word. But there's plenty I disagree with him on and plenty he disagrees with me on. But he's a force for good. And I'll give you just one example. So he came out, he put on um, Casey Means, Dr. Casey Means, who's Stanford-educated doctor, successful surgeon in Oregon, who's quit, notwithstanding the fact she was at the top of all of her college and her med school and her surgical residency classes, all of them, because she realized that the healthcare system was trying to keep us sick and really was just paying to throw drugs or scalpels at us. And she wrote this book called Good Energy, which Tucker had her on over. He had had her brother Callie Means on like a year earlier. And they're very much into the, why is our food system poisoned question? And why is, is our healthcare system so focused on, you know, treating the illness as opposed to preventing the illness? And that thing went totally viral because it was really interesting. And Tucker did a great interview. And then next thing you know, Robert F. Kennedy's out there endorsing Trump saying, make America healthy again and citing Casey Means and citing Callie Means. And then this past Monday, Ron Johnson holds a hearing in the Senate where he says, I, I heard Casey Means on Tucker Carlson's show, and I want to have this hearing. And you have all these like doctors from Harvard and from uh, Stanford and all over the country saying, yes, these are very good points. We should be talking about this. And th now the national conversation has been changed. And it's because Tucker will put on people who aren't everywhere. He'll take risks that a lot of people won't take. And so, look, while... He may, I don't actually know whether he did this, this is like a, a, a joke, but maybe he'll do something on the moon landing um, that some people may think is crazy, or maybe he'll go really controversial on Churchill versus Hitler, but it's worth it because he generates attention and he, in more times than not, uses that attention for good. And I want to say one other thing. So I have no tolerance for Alex Jones, none, for all sorts of reasons. Number one is that my empathy is entirely with the Newtown families and what he did with them was truly just near unforgivable. However, after I, I interviewed Alex Jones and it became this big thing on NBC, as you, as you know, they didn't like that I, your favorite word, platformed him. <laughs> um, I came back and we did all this fact checking of the interview. And of course there was more nonsense about the Newtown families, which I thought he was going to drop. I thought we might be able to have like a decent interview because he had moved past that stuff and he was going to be apologetic over it. He renewed it. But we fact checked everything he said. And I'm talking about the NBC fact checkers, which is like a lot of people with law degrees and not and you know PhDs and they run it all down. And Moynihan, can I tell you, he was right about issue after issue. I was like, what? Because we were trying to figure out whether it should go in the piece. And if it was crazy, you know, it's like, maybe we'll use it, maybe we won't, but we got to know if it's right. Like, there is a potential danger in having fluoridated water being pumped into everybody's water supply. He was talking about how they're doing, like, animal experiments where there are, like, goats that kind of look human and they're harvesting parts, and pigs, too. Well, yes, indeed, they are harvesting parts. They're doing these weird transhumanism mergers where they're trying to generate body parts for insertion in humans. Um, the thing about the frogs turning gay is also true. Frogs are based, I don't know if it's gay, but they're actually like male frogs are becoming female due to all like the, the chemicals and so on that are in the water. I know these sound absolutely insane. That is what I thought when I sat on the opposite end of Alex Jones hearing them. But then I, I've told the story long before Tucker sat down with Alex Jones this week. 
that I got back to NBC, we were all like, oh my God, <laughs> he's right about a lot. Not Newtown. But I'm just saying, like, it's very easy on the outside when you don't have time to run all this crap down to say, nutcase, nutcase, nutcase. That's insane. I'm on the side of, why don't we keep an open mind and go ad hoc through each person and their claims and figure it out after listening to them and then doing some research of our own. I wonder though if, it's, if there's certain things that are disqualifying. The thing that I found about Alex Jones, and this is the thing about Tucker too, is that you, know, you say people like Mike Johnson, he has an enormous reach and has enormous amounts of influence. When you're Alex Jones and you're saying that 9-11 was an inside job, and now Tucker is flirting with those ideas too, which offend me greatly. And, you know, saying something like Hitler was the great, uh, Churchill was the, the biggest enemy of World War II, which is, you know, obviously an insane thing to say. And for some reason, people are doing this to kind of vindicate or actually lessen the uh, guilt of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis is quite worrying. I mean, what are the guardrails when you say, if somebody says something that is just so transparently crazy, I stop trusting them as a source mm. to kind of aggregate information, adjudicate what's true or not, when you say that 9-11 was a controlled demolition or something like that. No, I hear you. Um, a couple of things on that. There, like people who are out there, let's say, you know, let's take up the Nazi Hitler thing. Like Jews are, and then insert some terrible libel against them. You know, as a group, they do this disgusting thing that is basically criminal. That's what Jews do. Hard no, right? Never again. I will never. Which I will Jones is flirted with video. quite a bit, by the way. Yeah. Uh, doesn't surprise me. So it, this wouldn't be somebody for me in any way, shape or form. But I don't see Tucker as that. I see Tucker, you know, he's done. I haven't seen his 9-11 stuff, but I understood his piece on Churchill to be a revulsion by Tucker to anybody who is he who he considers a neocon. He really is anti-war. You know, he's kind of a peacenik, but especially when it comes to the United States of America and anybody who has got their foot on the gas, recklessly pushing us toward that kind of a conflict is going to get it from Tucker. And that is probably the lens through which he decided we should reevaluate Churchill and just how bellicose he was and how willing he was or wasn't. And I've heard Victor's defense, you know, to get us to get Great Britain involved and get them to pull us in, into it and so on. Um so that I can categorize for Tucker and sort of make sense of for me. I do think there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. I mean, I'll tell you, like, not to pick on Joe Rogan, because I think he's an immense talent, but a very good friend of mine who's extremely well-educated and accomplished was telling me the other day she heard his bit on there not being a moon landing and that he was really persuasive on it. And... Can I tell you? So like, I am a lawyer. I am about facts. I spent like two damn hours going down this rabbit hole just because it's like, I guess I have to spend time on the moon landing now mm. trying to like see what are the arguments on both sides. P.S. I'm very convinced there was a moon landing. Um, <laughs> but it, I was really worried Joe there Rogan for a second be... that you're going to go full no. moon landing denier on me. <laughs> no, no, I haven't. But like, should Joe Rogan not not be somebody who has a microphone, who we listen to, who is tolerated by... Pol no, definitely not. He's raising stuff sometimes that's really important. He has very profound conversations at times. Others are wacky. Um, that's okay with me. It, it does take work if you want to stay factual and totally non-conspiratorial, even in a day and age when our conspiracies are being true, you know, proven true, like you know, lab mm. leak versus pangolin and all that. But I'm still more in favor of more voices versus fewer. And it, while it bothers me a little, some people who have gone really far on demonizing certain groups have become so popular. It's just that's America. And the answer to that is more voices that are sane, not fewer of those voices. I wonder if you agree with me on this, because, I mean, I've been thinking about this quite a bit recently. And, and I think that, you know, I kind of blame the previous gatekeepers for this, is that there was such a stranglehold on what one could say and what one could discuss, and that those guardrails were set by people that I think Tucker would call the elites, you know? And I mean, I think he, th he sees well, he everything through no that prism now. he has no love for William F. Buckley. Yeah, I, which is really surprising to me, actually, when I saw that conversation when he was, you know, denouncing uh, Buckley. But, you know, that, it's an interesting thing because, you know, people are desperate for information that is not filtered 
through everybody who went to Columbia Journalism School. And what's going to happen and what's going to come out the other end is a lot of people who have maybe kind of overcorrected and started to think that every elite is lying to them and every elite narrative is a conspiracy theory. And so one must push yeah. back against it. I mean, you know, I think that that's, you know, being somewhere in the middle of these conversations is actually the people who are, who are generally most successful. And I think that's why Tucker's interesting to people because as a, he's, he's a bit of an outlier in the sense that he's wildly successful and does go into these kind of odd places, right? I, speaking of kind of odd people, Donald Trump, um, recently, kind of, a, you know, I got very annoyed by this, that he was hanging around with Laura Loomer, this person for mm-hmm. those who inhabit the kind of precincts of the right might be familiar with, who is herself a 9-11 truther and went to Shanksville to the 9-11 memorial there with Trump. And that kind of stopped me for a second is that is who is allowing people that are this fringe and this crazy that close to the former president and potentially the next president. Does that worry Mm -hmm. you at all that people like that can kind of infiltrate into Trump's circle? I guess it doesn't worry me, but it doesn't seem like a great idea. Uh, I wish that Trump would be a little bit more careful. I don't know. I think there's a large section of the right, you know, the sort of more established, well, not established, but farther right, that is very conspiratorial. And I understand how they got there. And they, they're a little dangerous in the conversation. It's not that they should be out of the conversation, but they are a little dangerous because they'd have us question everything, everything. Yeah. You know, I don't like the 9-11 trutherism at all. I don't posit that the government told us every piece of truth at all, every relevant time about the Saudis mm-hmm. and everybody else. But in no world will anyone convince me it was an inside job. And I get irritated when people try to take the discussion there. That's upsetting to me. However, Trump has proven himself able to espouse rational policy and when he was president for four years, actually enact it, notwithstanding his penchant for listening to, you know, various corners, even very controversial corners. So I I don't it doesn't keep me up at night. Like, it's not great, but it doesn't keep me up. Let's talk briefly about the media's kind of how the media has handled this presidential election. Um, We're recording this on Thursday, uh, Wednesday, last night. uh, A journalist, and I should do air quotes on that, Stephanie Rule, uh, Mm. interviewed Kamala Harris. The vice president has not sat down for many interviews. I watch this with my jaw on the floor. How, How do you kind of look at the way the media has treated this election in particular when it goes back to Joe Biden. And I have to say my own opinion here, covering for Joe Biden for a very long time, which I think we see even in the reaction to something like this Olivia Nuzzi scandal. I mean, people are angry at her for writing about Joe Biden and being correct about that, which, you mm-hmm. know, it has this ricochet effect on, you know, a scandal that she's involved in. I mean, what do you think about the, the media's involvement in this election in the way they've handled both Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and Donald Trump. I'm enjoying watching them shatter what's left of their teeny tiny credibility. I mean, it's frustrating because we have a presidential election weighing in the balance, but it's, it's kind of satisfying, you know, when you want to pound them out of existence just to watch them do it to themselves. Great. You go ahead. You finish the job. You got it. You got this, Dana Bash. I'll just sit over here. I'll wait. You, right on. I've never, and I know that the press was against Trump in 16. Trust me, I, I saw it everywhere. One of my greatest challenges was trying not to become one of them when he was attacking me every night and my family was under armed security guards because of him. Um, I think I did a decent job of it. It wasn't perfect, but I think I did a decent job of not, you know, just being totally unfair to Trump and getting tr- Trump derangement syndrome. Um, but it's worse now. It's worse because at least in 16, they were close enough to their roots of we're not supposed to offer our opinions and we're not really supposed to put a thumb on the scale that they would Mm -hmm. at least try to fake it. You know, if given an opportunity, they wouldn't just completely run cover for Hillary Clinton if they got her. You know, they'd give her some challenging questions. And let's face it, she wasn't a likable person. So that was kind of easy for them. So now they're in a panic 
even though they had Trump as four years as president, they saw he wasn't some lunatic. He actually really helped the country in many ways. But then J6 came, and that was bad. And they're like, oh, no, oh, no, no. And so they've got their worst assumptions about Trump all in full gear. And they're just truly open campaign operatives now. That's what that ABC News debate was the biggest debacle on a debate stage we've ever seen, primary or general election. Each individual state is voting. It's the vote of the people now. It's not tied up in the federal government. I did a great service in doing it. It took courage to do it. And the Supreme Court had great courage in doing it. And I give tremendous credit to those six justices. There is no state in this country where it is legal to kill a baby after it's born. Madam Vice President, I want to get your response to President Trump. And it was sneaky disgusting. You know, it wasn't like a um, John King asking Newt Gingrich that question at the beginning of that mm -hmm. one debate about, do you have an open marriage with your wife? That's open gross. This, this one was sneaky. Like, we're just here. We're from ABC News. We're serious journalists. And no babies are being killed on the table after birth. Okay, which is, that's wrong. The word kill is controversial, but Trump actually defined it. He, he showed he was using it as an argument based on the facts of babies being allowed to die when they survive abortions on the table in this country. And it's happening all over, especially Minnesota. It had eight babies died under Tim Walz's gubernatorial reign um, after being born after false or faulty abortions. So it, what happens is they're not required to give life-saving care, just comfort care. And so they don't help the baby who's struggling, given all they just tried to do to him or her. It's extremely controversial and dark. Definitely did not deserve the, quote, fact check she tried to give. She's a partisan. She's obviously pro-choice. And she let it seep into the coverage that she did to, that night, which was shameful. And she later bragged about how she saw that lie coming and she prepped for it. She should have done some more prep. As she went out there with one hand tied behind her back when it comes to the facts. And then there was David Muir, equally bad, equally partisan, getting into an argument with the candidate about whether he was sarcastic on an earlier statement. Who died and made you the king of all emotions? Like, what is it, the emoji movie? Where they're like, mm. happy, he's got the... <laughs> Suddenly David Muir's in there, like the arbiter. Oh, no, that was not sarcasm. I can see yeah. that sincerity. It was so beyond, and it was such high stakes because that's probably the only debate we're going to see between these yeah. two. So we really desperately needed impartial arbiters, and we didn't get it. I'd like to think it wouldn't have been that bad, even though it was, some, it was bad uh, back in 2016 and 2020. You said that in 2016 you were under armed guard uh, because of things that Donald Trump had said about you. You've been called a racist. You've uh, pretty consistently been called a racist. You've been pretty consistently called a transphobe. Tell me how that affects your life. I mean, does it not bother you in any way? You know, the, the only people I've ever gotten like harassed by are leftists like on the streets of New York who would just sort of yell generic things at me. It's not, not like you're a racist, but just nasty things. They didn't like me as a yeah. Fox News anchor. And the, the hardcore, like, Trump faithful were very angry with me after that debate and when Trump kept stirring it up. And I definitely got, uh, you know, a few F-bombs and threatening comments and emails and texts and so on, voicemails. So everybody has hated them. you at certain points. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're <laughs> running the gamut from left to right. People are just denouncing Megyn Kelly on the street. <laughs> totally. But can I tell you, like, of all the people who have hated me or come after me or, you know, tried to ruin my life, there's one that sits above them all as the absolute worst. And that one goes by the letters NBC. When NBC tried to destroy you, I mean, was that purely politics? What actually happened prior to my abrupt departure from NBC is a long story, but I'll tell you another quick story, which is sometimes in contract law, when someone is wrongly pushed out of a position, um, they are forced to sign a deal in order to get the money that is already owed to them, yeah. and that would be they would be entitled to if any jury saw this case in order to actually just get that without having to lit litigate they have to sign these things called confidentiality agreements and as a lawyer i'm well schooled in those and so at this point not connected at all to that discussion i really choose not to say anything more about nbc we have a another 
you know, month and a half to, to the election. Um, give me a bit of prognostication. I mean, we have pretty split polls. You know, the Nate Silvers of the world and the people whose, you know, uh, opinions I trust on this say, look, 50-50, one day it's Kamala, one day it's Donald Trump. Uh, what do you expect the next month will bring us? And, you know, let me sharpen the question to say, if Donald Trump loses... What do we expect happens uh, to conservatism at that point when you have these, you know, gubernatorial candidates in North Carolina and the 2022, you know, destruction with uh, Herschel Walker and all these silly people? I mean, is there going to be a shakeup after this? I mean, you know, so many of these players. I mean, what do you expect the future will bring in a non-Donald Trump world? Well, honestly, like I... I shudder to think of Trump losing. I have said openly that I'm going to vote for Trump. I said it the day that Biden pushed through his Title IX changes and just rolled out the red carpet for men and boys to go into our daughters' locker rooms and sports and bathrooms uh, and beyond and try to redefine what is a woman with his pen. I mean, a non compass mentis mm -hmm. president just decided to redefine womanhood. Um, that was a bridge too far for me, and that was the first time in my career I've ever come out and said, this is who I'm voting for. And just so your audience knows, I, I'm, I am a very independent voter in my eight presidential elections that I've been alive to vote for and of age. I voted for four Democrats and four Republicans. I'm I'm not like some right down down the line Republican voter. I vote the person, not the party. And uh, but I'm definitely voting Trump. And I can't think of a world in which we wake up and he didn't win because it's going mm. to mean absolute change and dramatic transformation of the country when it comes to the illegal immigration situation. It just can't go on like this. We can't have a country when you have some, I mean, it's documented under, under Kamala and Biden, 10.4 million illegals came in under Trump. It was 2.3, 2.3 to 10.4 that we know of doesn't include the gotaways. Doesn't include the 1.3 million quote legal immigrations, uh, immigrate immigrants like we saw in Springfield, Ohio under Biden, the Haitian migrants. Mm -hmm. So that's a minimum, you know, of what, 10.4, 11.7. Is, is that your top issue? Biden. Is that the one that is motivating your, your vote more than any other? It's the one I think is the most important and that is the most dangerous for us all. Um, but the, the gender thing is huge for me. You know, I'm, I'm, I've said before, I'm almost a single issue voter, voter, but then the almost is in there because of the immigration issue. I know it's not a huge issue that's affecting millions of people like the immigration thing is, but we're, we're chopping off the body parts of perfectly healthy minors who just need a little therapy on divorces, on body image, on depression, on puberty. We have an entire system, the medical system, the, the, the school systems um, that are working together to push them without question towards sterility, um, an, an entirely changed life where their penis is chopped off, where a, a woman, a young girl trying to create a fake phallus loses almost all of her forearm and it's down to the tendon and bone only to create something that will never look like an actual male organ. And then when these kids get through it and realize, oh my God, I'm actually not trans at all. I was just going through a tough time. And I went to the, a psychiatrist controlled by the Psychiatric Association or by the American uh, Association of Pediatrics, who, all of whom say, affirm a firm that is the only thing available to you. I was shepherded into a, a worldview about myself that made them feel better about themselves, but not me, but actually wound up ruining my life. And where will they turn? That cannot be undone. None of it can. They will never have children. Those women will never breastfeed. They will never be able to change the forearm and the body parts and the, the voice and the Adam's apple and all of it. It's horrific. It's like a science fiction horror film what we're doing to minors who we won't even let get tattoos until they reach a certain age. It's deeply immoral. You know, it's interesting because I've, I've seen you on this issue um, over the years when, you know, it didn't get, I didn't think much attention from you or from most people actually. And I was know, on the, the other side. Last, yeah, you were on the other side. I, last couple of years, I've seen that, that change in you. You say this is kind of top of the list of the things that exercise you as an American, as a voter, what was it that did that to you? I mean, was there some experience, you know, in your child's school? Was it something personal? Because it just, it seems to have really 
kind of uh, taken over you. And you really, this is the thing you talk about more than prob- probably anything else outside of horse race politics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Once they started coming for the children, I really got alarmed. And it's not that I didn't know that children were involved in this thing prior. Like I did a segment on NBC with so-called trans children and I urged people to be understanding and to be non-bullying. And I think most Americans start from that point. We don't want to bully. We want to be accepting. We don't want to be unkind. And certainly women in particular, they always tap into our empathy. Um, And so that's how I started. And by the way, I have trans people in my family and in my husband's family. And I had no wish to be offensive to them. I understood. I think these are genuinely trans people who like, what I mean by that is I think they genuinely had gender dysphoria from a very, very young age. This wasn't a societal contagion like what is affecting our girls in particular right now. But then, that was 2018. Now, by the time we got to 2020, 2021, I looked around, and the whole world has shifted. This is being offered to our kids like, like you know, lasagna and chicken parm on an Italian menu. Like, you just pick the one you want. You can do it. And it's just totally harmless. It's that harmless. And I did see it. My daughter's school, that in the 10th grade, which only had 50 students in it when we were in New York, suddenly they had some nine girls who had declared themselves trans. That's, that was an issue that historically had affected overwhelmingly only boys, 99% was boys. Now suddenly 10%, 20% of the class has, is suddenly trans. It's a social contagion. And you had Lisa Littman at Brown who put out that very good study, which got completely assailed unfairly, because Brown is disgusting in many ways, um, that showed it was a social contagion. You had Abigail Schreier's book in 2020, Irreversible Damage, which showed it's a social contagion. And then it went to a place where it's like, not only is a social contagion like, like anorexia can be, where you lose a bunch of weight, but you put it then back on, and you get to the gym and you build muscle and you restore yourself. It is, as that name of the book says, irreversible damage. That not just we're allowing kids to do, but that we're foisting on them. Tim Walsh is number one. Number one. He's worse than Gavin Newsom on this issue. And she chose him knowing that. She's, she doesn't talk about it as much, but she's just as left as he is. She just doesn't espouse it as much. And so if these two have four years, never mind, God forbid, eight in the White House, more children will be cut up and hurt irreversibly. Some have died because they don't have enough colon or intestinal material to try to forge a fake vagina for the boys. I mean, this is so dark. I realize we've taken a dark turn. It's happening right now to young kids, to 13-year-olds. If we don't start talking about it and start standing up for our girls who are being hurt and our boys too, we're going to get a whole lot more of it. So yeah, it's a big thing. Yeah, I wonder if on the Democratic side, if you're looking at Kamala Harris's campaign, I mean, obviously, she's not talking to journalists very much. But, you know, I was at the the DNC and, you know, been watching this stuff very closely. And they have gone the other direction from 2020. I mean, one of the reasons I don't think she wants to talk to people is has to account for some of her positions in 2020, which were quite radical. I mean, do you see that um, as the Democratic Party realizing that that 2020 moment that that woke moment, that even maybe the Me Too moment has passed and they have to tack more to the center. I mean, talking about trans stuff is something that a very small percentage of the population wants to hear about. I mean, in, in a positive way from the Tim Walls perspective, do you think that you know, that focus now less on identity, uh, more on freedom in the DNC? I mean, we can say that it's BS. We can say that we don't believe it. But the instinct to go that direction suggests something to me, suggests that maybe the Democrats are coming back to earth on some of these culture war issues. I wish that were so, but I don't believe that for one minute. I think they are just as far left and hard left on these issues as they were in 2020. They've just realized they need to hide it. She would not have selected Tim Walls as her running mate if if I were wrong. She would have said, "That's I don't want that. I, I, we've got to move on from that. That was a crazy period in our history, and I've seen the light on this. And... Um, I I just don't think there's any evidence of that. I mean, right now you've got colleges across the country trying to get around the Supreme Court's ruling on affirmative action, saying you may not do that anymore. You had your fun dividing us by race. That's now recognized as unconstitutional. And what do they do? They change all the essays to say, tell me about something unique about yourself that I might not otherwise know. Like what 
clubs you were in, what groups you've joined. Right now, you've got all these guys like uh, and gals like, yes, I was the president of DEI in my, you know, it's so ridiculous. Some tried to actually demand video submissions. They're so stupid. So like there's been no pumping of the brakes on that. There's just been a realization that it's unpopular, but they really think that it's important, again, that it makes them good people. And I believe to Kamala Harris, among the few things she's genuinely committed to are um, abortion and full wokeness, DEI, you know, in all the way with 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 no exceptions. And I think that's one of the things she found attractive about him. And there are many ways that the federal government, including our president, can shove that down our throats. Look at Title IX. That's another that's an administrative agency, the Department of Education, that changed this rule that governs all of our young kids, especially our girls. And yes, they offered public comment. There was a ton of negative feedback. They didn't give a damn. They shoved it through anyway. And it's not just girls they hurt. They took away due process from young men on college campus who campuses who get accused of sexual assaults. Kamala Harris doesn't want you to have the, the right to cross-examine. She doesn't want you to have the right to see all of the evidence that the accuser, to see her text messages that may say, this was totally consensual. It's crazy what they can do. So don't think for a minute that the feds have no power over your life. They have a lot. That's Can you end on something positive? Get, Megyn Kelly, yeah. give me a positive uh, vision of America's okay. future uh, because you've given me quite a dark one. Okay, so first of all, I'll start where we began. Uh, Barry Weiss and yours truly, and you're in there too, Moynihan. So Barry, I've said to her before, I think on the ideological scale, she's definitely not a far lefty. She's probably like a, a if, if, if one is the super far left and 10 is the super far right, I put mm -hmm. her at like a four or a five. And I put myself at like a six or a seven, you know? Yeah. And yet we're dear friends. I absolutely adore her. She comes on my show and I go on hers. And that works. We can talk to each other. We still love each other and don't care about the differences that divide us. They're unimportant in the grand scheme. Um, you and your libertarian weird friends who come on my show all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I accept. I don't, I don't judge. I we can, but the, but all three of us have created, have helped create, and exist now in this ecosystem that is the antidote to all the media problems that we discussed, and it's not only working, it's crushing, it's literally crushing mainstream media. I mean, their their numbers are down, they're down. They want to get into our lane. I don't have a friend at Fox News who doesn't want to be doing what we're doing. That's good because they're being rejected, they're unimportant, and they're irrelevant. The, the nation knows it, and they know it too. Their time is very limited. So that's a good thing. I still believe in the law. There are reasons not to. I realize it's being bastardized by these George Soros prosecutors who don't want to prosecute the bad guys and just want to go after the Trumps of the world, and that we have overzealous prosecutors who will do exactly that, Trump and the indictments, blah, blah, blah. But for the first time in my lifetime, we have a genuinely conservative U.S. Supreme Court, and that is such a blessing. It's such a blessing because limited government, limited Supreme Court, uh, originalist interpretations are good. They're good for our society. It's what I believe the founders intended, and they will help restore order. Even if Republicans have to pay for the next 10 years for Dobbs, that was the right decision. That issue is for the states, not for the courts, and we have a Supreme Court now that will enforce those principles irrespective of its personality or if it's popularity level. Um, I also just think the natural means of conversation, whether it's podcasting or digital, whatever people are doing, has allowed for more fruitful conversations and bonding and wellness. And I, I'll go back to that example of the health and you know wellness and what's happening with our food supply. We know about that because it was carried on alternative media or digital media. And so now... Fewer people are going to opt for Fruit Loops because they see those red and yellow and blue dyes than would have during the dominance of broadcast or Fox. And that's going to lead people to live longer. It's going to lead people to feel better. It's going to lead people to do better in their day-to-day -day lives with their spouses. X being owned by Elon Musk is an absolute blessing. That's one forum in which we can have true free speech. And, and people are realizing how glorious it is. And another thing, the leftist overreach, you alluded to this earlier, is having a backlash with Gen Z and the generation coming up behind it, Gen Alpha, which is not buying into any of this nonsense. On the identity politics, they've revolted. And while I wouldn't necessarily call them MAGA Republicans, that's what a lot of them are becoming. The, in, as an F.U., 
to the people who are trying to make them obsess about identity, et cetera. So that's another thing I feel positive about. Uh, so those are just a few items to hold on to. When I go to bed, I wrap myself in my Supreme Court justice blanket. And I, I think about that. So I have to say that your show every day does what? 10x, 20x what most CNN shows get at 7, 8, 9 o'clock? I mean, you look at the ratings of these shows. Yeah. These are people who don't live in our universe believe that those are still the kind of, you know, because they, the, the, they do the debates. They will do, I mean, they, it's CNN, it's, it's CBS. It's like your show does presumably, you know, 10 times that. You know, these shows that have 200,000 yeah. uh, viewers in the demo, 150,000 viewers in the demo, right? I mean, your popularity and the popularity of, honestly, and a number of other things too, I think is much more meaningful than people give it credit for. I mean, if you, if you take all of these shows, they're disaggregated from, you know, the Tim Pools on one side and then, you know, the fifth column and your show and even Joe Rogan. This is not an expressly political show, but he is exhausted by one narrative and puts other voices on there. I mean, it just says something, I think, about this cultural moment. And I think it says that, you know, 2018 to 2019, I would, I would say from Ferguson to 2020, that narrative lost. The, you know, the media gave it, yeah. gave it the old college try. And it certainly didn't come out on top. Listen, I can guarantee you that both places I worked prior to going independent wanted very much for me never to work again. Would have been mm -hmm. really happy to see me never emerge in front of a micro microphone again. And then you started the show by mentioning that semaphore piece, we got to July, which is a very busy news month for me and for every news outlet. And in yeah. that month... Our show had, I think it was 217 million downloads on or views on YouTube, and mm. all of NBC News had 89 million. All of NBC, World News, I mean, the um, Nightly News, the Today Show, all of MSNBC, and that was in a month in which they had the Olympics. So their online properties had been bolstered by that. Um, so that's just, and not to mention, we beat NBC, we beat CBS, we beat uh, the BBC, we beat Sky News, you know, and it continues. I mean, August was just as good. So that tells you something, right? That's just me. That's me and my six staffers. Yeah. That's not like yeah. all of NBC. We, we got two thirds of CNN's online uh, presence. And they have, literally, when I was in news, they had 100 staffers on Anderson Cooper show alone, never mind mm -hmm. all of CNN. So you can see where the future's going. It's an individual relationship between the audience and the one or two or three people they trust and choose to spend their time with. It's a much mm. more honest way of getting your news and, and smart way of getting your news. And you can see, you know, the necessity is the mother of all invention, that the people want it. They were thirsting for it. You watch cable news right now. It's like watching Fred Flintstone in the, in the, bottomless Same car way. with the feet yeah right yeah it's just wonderful yeah. to be in like the new relevant important lane and i really believe we're making a difference then kelly thank you for joining us thanks moynihan see you soon